we'll let everyone else trickle in as they come. Uh, appreciate everyone for joining. Really excited to have special guest, uh, associate head coach from University of Pacific, Leonard Perry. Uh, thanks to Rising Coaches for this awesome platform they continue to provide. Uh, if you haven't been to risingcoaches.com yet to check out the memberships and all that they have to offer, uh, very affordable, a ton of different options of things you can do to grow, get better, network. Uh, definitely make sure you take some time to check that out. Um, but we're excited today. We'll go kind of in a format where we will uh, have a quick interview with Coach uh, from the moderators. And then from there, we'll go question and answer from the room. And after question and answer, Coach will break down uh, some basketball stuff, kind of getting into – uh, some rebounding and also some zone stuff. So, uh, and then we'll break for one more question segment at the end. But excited to have Coach Perry here today. Um, I will have to break away uh, probably the last 20 minutes. So, um, Coach Kareem Brown from Niagara County will take over and Anisha Miller. Um, but looking forward to it. So, we're excited. Um, could say a number of things about Coach Perry um, in my introduction to him. I think it goes without saying most of you that signed up to come to join us today have learned a little bit about him, but um, it's definitely, I think Coach Hodge from um, North Texas talked about this at the Social Justice Roundtable. We'll let Coach Perry tell us a little bit about the uh, him in the picture of short shorts as a, almost a retired guy who played uh, in the Dallas area, but a uh, really good player coming out. Uh, believe played two years of junior college. Is that right, coach? That is correct. Played two years of junior college, went on to play division one, um, and just has a really decorated career as a coach. Um, has been a head coach, um, division one, has played division one, has coached in the NBA level, has been to multiple NCAA tournaments, has uh, been an associate head coach on multiple staffs. And outside of just the impact from a basketball standpoint, I think uh, it goes without saying on this particular Rising Coaches platform, there's been at least six or seven coaches who have referenced Coach Perry in their interviews or in their talks uh, with Rising Coaches. So I give Coach a lot of credit for his impact, not only on players and programs, but on other coaches in the industry. I think that says a lot about him. Uh, I think I've, I've said this to my wife. Um, he is definitely to be given credit for uh, me finally kind of stepping up like I needed to, having a real conversation with him about non-basketball stuff, real life stuff. Uh, Coach has always been a big brother, a mentor. He has several um, footprints and, and ripple effect of positivity that he's left in this business. But I can speak from a professional standpoint and a personal standpoint. He's impacted uh, not only me and my career, but my family uh, and my well-being there. So he's all around just uh, uh, you won't find anyone that will say anything bad about him. Uh, I think his reputation is in quiet, um, but we want to make it a little bit louder that people understand how good he is, uh, and we want to celebrate him today. So we're excited to have him. Uh, can go on and on about the man that he is, family man. We'll let him tell us more about all those things, but – just can't say enough great things about Coach Perry and what he's established in his career, his reputation, and he is a Division One head coach still to this day, and uh, we hope that he gets that opportunity uh, not to take him away from Coach Stoudemire, but we hope that uh, as they continue to have success, Coach Perry gets that credit. So uh, real quick, Coach, we'll just open it up and kind of start with a simple question. COVID-19 has kind of shook all of us as far as unexpected um, just turn of events. So what's some of the things during COVID that's been either funny or that you've learned that are humorous about yourself or your family during this time since we've been locked in the house for a long time? Well, uh, Brian, thank you for the kind comments. I, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely humbled um, by the kind words. Um, I am. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm excited. Uh, get a chance to you know, kind of open up about uh, myself and, uh, you know, kind of share with everybody um, what's happened to me uh, in, in my time on, on this planet. 
but to, to start this out, uh, a funny thing about myself or my family, um, the one thing that's happened to me, I, I believe that um, my wife, after 30 years, has finally entered the transfer portal. And um, I'm trying to get her out of it. Uh, I don't, I don't <laughs> I've been home a little bit too long. So she's in the portal. And uh, yeah, she, she's, uh, she's definitely high major. But, uh, you know, I've learned, I've, I've learned that uh, during this quarantine, Brian, it, I'm, I'm, I'm a poor listener. I'm a really poor listener. Um, I, I, I've always thought that I was a pretty good listener, but I've learned that I'm a poor listener uh, in listening to my children, uh, being around my kids, being around my grandkids. I'm a poor listener. So uh, that was my number one priority was to uh, become a better listener. And uh, I, I think that, you know, I'm on the right path. Uh, my family has assured me that they would assist me in this area. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's probably the funniest thing. Um, I, I pay better attention to detail than I did, and I thought I was pretty good at it. But my family is reminding me that uh, you, you're not, nowhere close to as good as you think. So, so tell us a little bit, Coach, before we move to the next thing about your wife getting the transfer portal. We know she's high major. Uh, <laughs> that last time with another – uh, team yet, and then tell us a little bit about the listening. Did, did you, one of your kids have to throw something at you because you were being so uh, dismissive to their conversation, or were you were you multitasking? Were you text messaging? What what was it, Coach? You know, um, yeah, I, I think it's a little bit of all of that, Brian. Um, if you're in this business long enough, you learn to, uh, when someone calls your name and you're in the middle of something else, to almost kind of do both things at once and to give someone your undivided attention. And I, I say it facetiously as a joke, uh, but, I, but I really did mean it. Um, I, I had to, I, I needed to become a better listener. I needed to uh, become a better husband through listening better. I need to, needed to uh, become a better dad through truly listening um, and, and digesting what my children were saying and how they were saying it, um, no matter if it was big or small. Uh, it could have it been you know, something that they wanted to share about their lives. Um, and I'm in the middle of a text to recruit, uh, or I'm talking to a head coach, um, uh, or I'm watching the news, or I'm watching a, a game. I'm breaking down film. I, I needed to learn how to put that down, put it down, uh, look directly uh, into everyone's eyes that, that just call my name and, and um, listen. And you'd be surprised if you try that, how short your attention span is based on what we've done the last, what I've done the last 30 years. Um, your attention span is really short. And um, I needed to um, dig deeper. Uh, within. Um, I'm a faithful man, uh, but I needed to dig deeper uh, in my faith. I needed to meditate a little bit, step back a little bit, um, not be so engulfed with social media. Um, and this has been a great time to do that. And I think I've become better. My wife says, and by the way, coincidentally, she can enter the transfer portal um, all she wants to, she ain't never getting a release out of this marriage. That ain't happen. That's not gonna happen. I know um, that was the best decision that, that that I've ever made. So that's not gonna happen. Number one, I'm the AD, and I'm not signing any release play paper. So <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, and uh, I could definitely relate on both of those. So thank you, <laughs> so, thank you, thank you to you and your no, wisdom. No, I'm not. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. But but being able to to, to step away. Um, and, and really understand what listening is, um, redefine what listening is, and being away from our players. Um, when I get a chance to talk to them on the phone, um, through, through Zoom, um, really be present. I mean, really be present, not just a little bit, not doing some things here or there, but really be present and be able to regurgitate um, what you've talked about uh, with the party that you're communicating with. And I, I think it's going to make me a 10 times better coach. 
No, that's really good. I think we all can take something from that, Coach, because uh, we our lifestyles are so fast and so go and so on the hustle, on the move. Uh, we get accustomed to that being our normal. So people kind of have to try to adjust to us at our normal and how to communicate with us. And this slowdown and this COVID uh, and some of the quarantine has just made us have to be more present and, and realize how much we really weren't present before. So I respect you a ton already, but just for opening up to say that, because that's such a true thing. Um, tell us a little bit about your family, Coach. I think we know a little bit. Um, those, of, those of us that know you closely know you have uh, a close-knit family, a family you care a lot about. So, And you have a new member of the family who's also in the coaching profession. So tell us about your family. I do. I do. Uh, uh, really, when, when you mention family, everybody throws the word around. When we talk about basketball, we talk about, you know, we want to recruit you. We want you to become a part of our family. Um, we want you to be a part of our family. Well, you know, I think about that in a couple of different ways. Um, it's a little bit different as it pertains to athletics because um, a, a family member can't transfer. A, fa a family member, uh, you know, can't say, I, I don't want to play anymore, so, you know, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, your family is your family. Um, that's, that's, that's who you're born into, that's who you're raised with, and that's who you're going to die around if you're fortunate. Um, so my, my family is, uh, is really, really important to me. My wife, um, we have five children, um, and my oldest son actually lives in Dallas, and uh, he's 34 years old. Um, I have a daughter who lives in Dallas. Um, she's 30 years old. Um, I, have, I have two girls. My wife and I have uh, two girls and a son. Um, oldest girl is, is 29, 28, and 21. Um, and my children have been as big of reason in my wife in any success that I've had in this business. They, I, I attribute all of the success, number one, to my wife because she holds it together. Um, even when I come apart, um, in overreacting to this business or something that's happened in this business or something that I wish could have happened in this business. My wife is always the person there to put it back together. Um, I've asked her to move um, from one end of the country to the other um, over seven times. And the only response I've ever gotten for her from her is give me five minutes, let me get my coat. And I, I couldn't ask for a better partner. Um, I just couldn't. This is a, a treacherous business um, that we're in. Uh, as great as it is, it can be just horrendous on a family, having to up and move a lot. And we've done that. And my wife has kept it together. Uh, we put our kids through college and um, really blessed that way. Um, our oldest daughter, uh, Keisha, got married uh, over a year ago to Dan Russell, who was the head coach at Casper Junior College. So we, we added another basketball layer to our family. And now um, we have uh, a grandson, uh, Hayes Leonard, that we just adore. And um, my oldest son has a daughter. And uh, my next oldest daughter uh, has a daughter. So I'm a grandpa. And um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a different deal. Uh, it's a different deal. Um, I said I wasn't going to spoil my grandkids and do this and do that. And they literally walk all over me, literally. And I love it. Um, so it's, it's, it's our family. It's our little unit. Uh, we love being around each other. Any chance we get, we, we travel. We just got in the car and went to Bozeman. Uh, my wife and I just woke up one day and said, we're going we're gonna to drive to Bozeman and see Hayes and, and uh, Keisha and Dan. And we did that, stayed for a week. Um, our daughter, Kayla, is home now um, because of the, the pandemic. She lives in L.A., um, so she's home, working from home. She's here, and uh, my son is here. Um, so it's been great. It, it's really been great. This is the longest time I've ever spent consecutively around my wife, other than when I was chasing her to make her my wife, and uh, my children. Um, it's, it's the longest time, so I've gotten to know them even differently than, than I had before. That's awesome. That's awesome, Coach. Um, definitely the twists and turns of this business definitely uh, 
got to praise our wives, that those of us that have them, that are willing to jump on a, a plane or a, a moving truck or whatever it may be uh, and live in wherever places we may be working. So uh, definitely have so much respect for how much your family means to you and uh, excited about the new, the new grand uh, baby in the house, seeing a different side of LP is a good thing, man. It's a good thing. I'm not surprised that, uh, that you're spoiling as much as you are. Uh, tell us about your basketball playing career a little bit and tell us kind of your career path, how you've gotten to where you are now. Um, I have no idea how I've gotten to where I am now, but I'll start at the beginning. Uh, I've, I've been really lucky, but um, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, I, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My parents um, weren't together. Uh, my dad fought in Vietnam and uh, they, they were married, but uh, my father is from Chicago. So as far back as I can remember, I've been getting on airplanes in the summer, going to see my father in Chicago on the west side of Chicago. So I was raised in Dallas. Uh, and then a big part of me was raised in Chicago as well. Um, I learned about basketball through my dad. My dad's a Hall of Fame state basketball player, went to Marshall High School uh, in Chicago. And uh, my dad went to Bishop College, a predominantly black college <clears throat> in Dallas, Texas. That's where my mother and father met. Um, my dad was a great player. He's Hall of Fame in the state um, uh, uh, of Illinois and, and Hall of Fame in the city as well. I mean, he's a great basketball player, but I grew up in football territory. So I played football a lot. Uh, growing up, my mother was was really big on on football. My dad was obviously a great basketball player, and uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I wanted to be like my dad. And I I got into basketball, stopped playing football. My mother was devastated. My dad was happy, um, and really started competing uh, from the time I was a young guy um, in Salvation Army tournaments um, all the way through. Uh, high school and there was no there was no AAU circuit when I was playing. Um, you played in the summer. Uh, you know I played in Chicago. I played in Dallas uh, growing up, but there was no AAU circuit. But ironically, uh, when I got to high school, I had a good career in middle school at T.W. Brown. But I got to high school. I went to Kimball High School. The head coach at Kimball High School was Jimmy Tubbs. Jimmy Tubbs went to college at Bishop College with my father. Um, so he, he knew everything there was to know about my dad. Uh, unfortunately for me, being away from my dad, um, Jimmy Tubbs became a, a surrogate father. So he already had permission to do whatever he needed to do to keep me in line. And uh, th that was far reaching, let me tell you. Um, but I played at Kimball High School and, and I had a tremendous career with Coach Tubbs. Um, one of the best basketball minds I've, I've ever known in my entire life. Uh, and uh, I went to McLennan Community College, played there for two years, um, and got a scholarship to the University of Idaho. And um, I played there for two years uh, and had a tremendous career. Um, won a lot of basketball games in high school, um, made all state, uh, won, a, won a ton of games in junior college, went to the region uh, championships and um, went to the University of Idaho and, and uh, played for Kermit Davis my junior year and Larry Eustachian my senior year. And uh, went to the NCAA tournament my junior year on a buzzer beater. Um, we were uh, ranked in the top 30 in the country. Um, we used to um, have our way around the Northwest um, and knew immediately once I got to Division One I, I was going to get into coaching. I knew it. Um, my idols were, were Jimmy Tubbs, who was a high school coach. He was my idol. Um, uh, Kermit Davis uh, was a mentor. Larry Stacey was a mentor, obviously. And I knew I wanted to get into coaching. And as soon as I was done playing, I went straight from the conference champ postseason tournament championship uh, to cleaning up the locker room. And um, that, that was a humbling experience because there were still guys on the team that I had played with the year prior. Um, so I was a student assistant first um, and got right into it, um, put, put everything on hold. I knew that's what I wanted to do, took some part-time jobs in, in Moscow and got right into it. And uh, Larry left and went to uh, Utah State and Joe Cravens came, who was uh, so good to me. He was really, really good to me. He understood my goals. Um, Coach Cravens helped me um, 
in getting started. Uh, let me hang around. Let me be in, in staff meetings. Um, let me uh, go get lunch. Um, and when I tell you I started from the bottom, I did. I, I really did. Uh, I knew nothing. I played the game all my life. Um, thought I knew exactly how to do this, how hard could it be, and knew nothing. Knew absolutely nothing about nothing. Um, knew nothing about recruiting, knew nothing about how to run a practice, knew nothing about all the details it takes to run a program. And Coach Cravens allowed me in the, in the, in the front door. And uh, he was great. And I got my degree. And uh, Coach Eustace had always told me if I ever wanted to, to get start, get in, get in this business, he would help me. And uh, at that particular time, they had the restricting, this restricted earnings coach. You had two full-time coaches and you had a restricted earnings coach. And he had a spot open for restricted earnings coach. And I give him so much credit because Coach Eustace at that point had never had a black assistant. Um, he had never had a, an African-American uh, assistant coach. And he hired me. And the minute I got there, I still knew nothing. And I think I was there for maybe an hour and, and had gotten fired uh, in the hallway um, and didn't know what to do. Um, little did I know that was the first of about a million times that Larry Station would fire me. Um, I, I thought when he said, you're fired, get out, I thought that meant literally go back to your uh, apartment, get your stuff and get, and get out. So. Uh, my wife was coming down the hall. We had just unpacked the apartment and uh, he had just fired me. I told my wife, we got to pack this back up. I, I just got fired. She said, she said, what? So uh, I had to learn the business from the ground up. And if there's one thing you learn uh, with Larry Eustace is you will be, you will be humbled in this business. Um, you will not come in this business ahead of anybody else. Um, you're not going to move up the ladder. Uh, above anybody else you're going to earn everything that you get and um, that's how I learned this business and, and I thank God uh, for him um, because he made sure that I learned the business from the inside out he did not allow me to uh, be labeled as just a recruiter um, he made sure that I knew what a budget was um, that I knew what the rules were um, that I knew uh, what academics meant and uh, how to recruit a, a junior college player, how to recruit a high school kid, how to recruit a transfer, uh, what to do when they got there, um, where they were going to live, um, who's going to be in charge of what, um, how to talk to an athletic director. Um, he taught me every nuance of the business from A to Z. He was very, very demanding, very, very tough on me, but I, I thank him for it. Um, because I still use those lessons today and I try to pass them down as much as I can and share them. Um, and from that point, um, Coach Eustace saw something in me. He just did. Um, I don't know what it was he saw. Um, I was afraid of him all the time, um, but there was something about me that he thought was different. He really thought it was different. And it gave me a ton of responsibility um, the, the minute I got on campus. And the next thing you know, that turned into uh, scouts and, and recruiting and uh, timeouts and uh, half times and uh, game adjustments. And, you know, he, he's always treated me um, like I was an exceptional basketball coach. And if he felt like I was getting to a point where I knew too much, he would take me down a peg or two. Um, and then he would build me back up. And then he would take me back down. And then he would build me back up. Um, so I, I really learned the business from the inside out. Um, and one opportunity led to another. Um, I went with Coach from Utah State to Iowa State. Um, I was with him on the interviews. Um, not one interview did he go in and not take me. From the interview with Gene Smith to the committee, um, to boost an alumni committee, to panels. Everywhere he went, he took me, everywhere, everywhere. When he was discussing his contract, I was in the room. Um, when he was discussing the years, I was in the room. When he was discussing details, I was in the room. When he was at his interview with all the people that were going to be the Board of Regents, I was in the room. Um, and not in the room, at the table. Um, he was vehement about that. Same thing at Colorado State. Um, and 
he was instrumental in, in me getting a head coaching job at the University of Idaho. And um, things weren't going great when I got the job at Idaho. And, and Larry Stacey picked up the phone and called Mike Bone, who's now the athletic director at USC, and said, Mike, here's the deal. Um, you're going to work out what you need to get worked out with Leonard, or I'm going to have him on a plane back here, um, and he's going to get a job in your league, and he'll win there, and you'll be known as the athletic director who had a chance to hire him and didn't. Um, so I don't know what's going on, but you're going to get that right. Um, and they did. Um, and, and uh, you know, my career is – I've been blessed. I've been really blessed. I'm very humble. Um, coach always taught me to let the work um, speak for itself, and I've been able to do that. I've never been a self-promoter. Um, there are probably a ton of people on here who have no idea who I am, and I think that's great um, because I've learned that that's not what's important in this business. It, it really isn't. Um, that's the last thing. The most important thing is how you treat people. Um, how comfortable you are with players, the impact you have on those guys when this is over, and the relationships. Yeah, that's a rare uh, – credit to you, Coach. That's a rare, rare, rare position to ever be in for any assistant to have that kind of relationship with somebody like Coach Stacy, and for him to bring you into that level of intimate privacy as far as, you know, contract negotiations or head coaches' meetings or – some of those things are things that people earn along the way, but very few of us will ever have the opportunity to have uh, all of those kind of things happen uh, that you did. So uh, credit to you on that, Coach. And we know you coach in the NBA. We know you coach for a great head coach now and Coach Stoudemire, and you guys had an amazing year. We'll talk uh, about Pacific specifically next. But just what, as far as the NBA and your experience there, has helped you uh, now that you're a college coach um, we'll talk kind of, like I said, specifically about Pacific and how those things tie in. But just college basketball in general, if you had to say, how does that help you in today's game being a former NBA assistant? Well, it's kind of twofold. I I'll say this. If you're in this business long enough, you're going to be fired, um, whether justly so or it was, a, it was a bad decision by administration. Or if you stay in here long enough, with the exception of a rare few, um, you will be let go somewhere along the line. And the opportunity I had in the NBA um, came because uh, I got fired at Idaho. Um, I still had uh, two years left on my deal. I got fired. Um, and again, uh, Coach Eustace is the first call I made. And uh, we had a, a former player, Jamal Tinsley, play for us at Iowa State. Um, probably could be the, the greatest player I'll, I'll ever coach. Um, was playing for the Indiana Pacers. And, and coach, <laughs> you, you really have to know Larry Stacey to, to really understand me. Co coach cares about no protocols. Like he could care less about protocols. Um, you should go through this guy to get to this guy to get to that guy, the network. Like, Coach could care less. He could care less. Coach says, hey, I think the Indiana Pacers would, would be great if they hired you. So I'm sitting there. I'm licking my wounds uh, in Moscow, Idaho, wondering what my next move is going to be. And I'm like, Coach, the Indiana Pacers are never going to hire me. I just got fired in Idaho. <laughs> You don't go from Idaho to the Indiana Pace. No one does that. Like, we don't even know anybody in the NBA. I have no networks. So uh, Coach says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, I'm gonna, let me make some calls, Leonard. Let me make some calls. I'm going to call you back. This was on a Monday about noon. This guy gets on the phone, finds the number to Donnie Walsh, who's probably going to go down as one of the greatest basketball minds in the history of basketball um, at any level, finds the number to Donnie Walsh. If you can imagine, you don't just pick up the phone in the NBA and call uh, a president or a GM. You've got to go through a secretary, through an administrative assistant, through a personal assistant. Um, there are three layers of protection that you got to go through. 
to get to the president of the Indiana Pacers. This guy somehow gets through to Donnie Walsh, never met him a day in his life, knows no one with the Indiana Pacers whatsoever. Gets through, calls me back at about 5.30 in, in, in the only Larry Stacy snicker you would ever know. Five o'clock calls me, Leonard. <laughs> I, I talked to Donnie Walsh. I think Rick Carlisle is going to call you in about 30 minutes. <laughs> so, oh <my> God. <laughs> so after a few moments of disbelief, I hang up the phone with Coach. Um, Rick Carlisle calls, says uh, Donnie spoke to Larry, and um, he'd like to visit with me. And... Um, Tuesday morning, I'm on a flight to Orlando to the summer league um, in the NBA, and Rick Carlisle picks me up from the airport. Um, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. We get talking. He says, okay, um, put your bags up. We're standing in the embassy suites at the time. He said, we're going to go to lunch. We go to lunch. He comes and picks me up. I'm at lunch. I get fired on a Sunday. Talk to Larry Stacey on a Monday. Rick Carlisle calls 5.30 Monday afternoon. Tuesday, I'm in Orlando. I'm having lunch with Donnie Walsh, Larry Bird, Rick Carlisle, and Johnny Davis. Literally, you're speechless. So Larry Bird's asking me questions. And I'm answering questions in a dialogue with, with Mr. Bird. And Donnie Walsh is asking me questions. Rick Carlisle is asking me questions. Uh, Johnny Davis is asking me questions. I stay at the Summer League the rest of the week until Thursday. The Summer League ends. Rick says, hey, I want you to come back to Indiana with us. I'm thinking we're going to catch a plane, uh, the commercial flight. We're going to a private airport. We're on Larry Bird's jet. Uh, we're flying back to Indiana. I still don't know what's going on. Get there. I'm there a couple of days with Coach Carlisle. We're just talking basketball. And 24 hours later, um, I go in. I was called upstairs to Donnie Walsh's office. Um, Larry Bird's coming out of the office. And if you know Larry Bird, he's he's got a he's got a funny sense of humor. Um, I'm going in the door. He says. Shit, Leonard, I'd hate for you. Um, he's coming out the door. I go in. They offer me a contract. And uh, that, was, that was how I got to the NBA. And uh, it, was, it was miraculous. But that, that's, that's how I got there. And uh, it, was, it was an unbelievable experience. Um, I had no idea how bright these guys were. Um, it's, it's, it, it, my experience there was... People ask me what it was like, um, and I tell them it was like working with, it was like working with twelve Tom Brady's, in terms of intellect and basketball knowledge. These guys are, their IQ is through the roof. I mean, it's through the roof. Um, the NBA has a completely different terminology. I knew none of it. Um, it was like being dropped off, uh, in Mexico and not speaking a word of Spanish but you got to figure it out. <clears throat> so I, I wrote every term down that there was in the history of the NBA from 1970 to, uh, to 2006. In, any term in that entire, we had Chuck Person, we had Johnny Davis, we had Rick Carlisle, we had, uh, we had Dan Burke, we had Chad Forcier, um, all those guys are lifelong NBA guys. I wrote down every word there was. And in about four days, I had it down um, to where I understood the NBA terminology. And we went from there. And Rick Carlisle was, was amazing to me. He was, he was unbelievable. Um, I had gotten fired at Idaho. We had a 2-3 zone. We were pretty good at it. It was a matchup 2-3. Um, we're getting ready to play the Toronto Raptors. And Rick says, Leonard, I, I, I watch your tapes. I know you're good at this 2-3 matchup. I want you to put it in. <laughs> and so, 
So I, I put the two three matchup in. He had never seen it before, so I put it in, and uh, we went to Toronto. We won the game. Um, he wanted to use it um, as a jump defense. We did. Um, just kind of flipping ahead, he goes to the Mavericks. Um, they use that same. Him and Dwayne Casey used that same two three matchup. They won a world championship with Dirk Nowinski. Um, the zone was used because of Dirk because he just he couldn't switch ball screens. He struggled to guard, um, so they used it because of him, and it helped him win a title uh, against the Heat. But I, my experience there was great. It, it was great. I loved it. Um, I worked every position in the NBA they had. Um, if they had something they remotely thought they needed a position, I did it. I was an assistant coach. Um, I was an advanced scout. Um, I was director of pro personnel. Um, whatever they needed, I did it, um, and I learned a ton about the league. So my, my time in the NBA was special. Yeah, that's awesome, coaches. Again, another uh, – I've known you for a long time. I haven't gotten to hear all those stories, but I'm sure we could talk NBA all day. It's amazing. Um, again, credit to you for being able to be a former college head coach and find your way into the league and have a niche on a staff uh, of an NBA champion player in Bird uh, and an NBA champion coach and Carlisle and everyone else you were associated with. Uh, so speaking of NBA, uh, I grew up uh, a Damon Stoudemire, Mighty Mouse fan. I think I had the jersey, Toronto Raptors purple jersey. I uh, was such a big fan of him as a lefty point guard. We played, we, I played the position not near closely as good as him. Not many have. But um, I've got a, the blessed opportunity to talk with him some. And what a down-to-earth dude. You know, I was at Fresno while you guys were at Pacific, so I got to know him a little bit. But um, – what makes him special? I mean, I think we all know about him as a player, uh, his toughness, his IQ for the game, uh, his ability to just make plays and have a smile on his face as he's taking somebody's heart out. Uh, I'm sure he has the same mentality uh, as a coach. But what, what are three things, if you had to say, makes him special as a college coach? Because let's be honest, not a lot of guys can go from that level uh, to being a successful college coach. So credit to Damon. Uh, huge fans from afar and just want to just curious what three things would you say make him I know there's more than three but what would yeah. be three one is um Damon Stoudemire when you meet him that's exactly who he is that's exactly who he is so I've introduced you to him before um you met him you know, initially, whatever your thoughts were, when you initially met him, that's exactly who he is. Just a cool dude. That's who he is. He's not, it's not a front. It's not, you know, behind closed doors. He's this way. How you met him is exactly who he is. He's a, he's, he's a cool dude. Uh, way, way, way cooler and down to earth and regular guy than you would expect for somebody who was as good as he was, bottom line. I mean, I, I yeah. wasn't expecting it. He's, he's, if, you, if you meet him in a game and he's watching a game, um, he's, if you stay there long enough, he's going to go get a hot dog. Like he's going to go get a hot dog. He's going to go get some peanuts. Um, he's going to get some water. Um, he, he is a really uh, humble person. Um, and as good a coach as he is, and I hear that all the time. As good a coach as this person is, he's a better, he's a better person. He's a good, he's a good man. He's a, he's a, he's a really nice man. Um, he's a really nice man. He when he's put in situations where he has to make a difficult decision, um, you know, maybe maybe a player did something or or um, a player's in trouble. Or, he never he never overreacts. He never gets so angry. Um, that he's upset and it carries over. He always puts himself, is able to put himself in the other person's shoes, whether it works out or not. I'm not saying every single time it works out. Even when it doesn't work out, he's still a nice man. Um, he still keeps in touch with, with those kids or, or those people. If someone does something to him or says something about him that's not nice, um, he's still able to be the same Damon Stoudemire to them, to their face. And when he's away from them, the average person would hold a grudge or find something wrong with that person. 
and in his heart, he he's always like, ah, it's not a, you know, it's not, it's not that big a deal. You know, you got to understand where they're coming from or the reason they did it maybe was because they're having a bad day. Um, he's very humble that way. And, and I think that's a, that's something that you can learn from and pick up and take with you wherever you go. Um, the other thing about Damon Stoudemire is he listens. Um, he's a good listener. I'm a poor listener. He's a good listener. Um, he's a good listener. Even in a hostile environment, um, he, he listens. Now, the way Coach Stoudemire listens is you may say it. He may not acknowledge it at all. He may not say anything about it. But two weeks later, he may say, Coach, on last Thursday at 3 o'clock at 3.30, um, when you were sitting in the right chair facing me um, and the wind was blowing from the north to the south and the trees were leaning in, um, you said A, B, C, and D. I think that's a great idea. So <laughs> he hears everything that you say. He listens to it. He may not use it. Um, he's a guy that thinks he, he thinks things through. Um, if he hears something, maybe it's a good idea on the spot, but he loves to sleep on it and wrestle with it and come to good terms with it. So if he disagrees with you, he slept on it. He really thought about it. So when he comes back, he, he, he will explain the reasons why um, he's going to go a different direction. Um, and I was super respect him for that, as opposed to acting like he hears you and doesn't hear and not going to do anything or acting like he's going to do it and doesn't do it. Um, he really puts thought um, into, you know, into that. And the third thing that I believe that, you know, makes him a great coach is um, he just believes in a lot of freedom. He believes in freedom. Um, he does. He believes in freedom. Um, if you're a guy that can make difficult shots, he will have your back. He will have your back. He will have your back. If you're a guy that takes difficult shots and never makes them, he'll support you, just not in games. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> He's, he's very smart that way, uh, but he's a he's a he's an easygoing person. Um, he really is. He's he's very easygoing. Um, he reads a lot. Um, he reads a lot, uh, and and he's uh, he's insanely bright. So those are the things I think that make up the the Damon Stoudemire that I know, and how he's become the coach that he is. No, that's great. That's great. And, uh, you know, just having that humility with his resume, I'm sure, goes such a long way with people on campus, <clears throat> excuse me, with recruits, people in the community. Um, again, I, the basketball results speak for themselves, which we'll talk more and more about. But for him being a high-quality person and character and um, just person of, um, you know, willing to connect still, uh, at his level is, is just so impressive to me. And I appreciate you sharing that part about him, Coach. Um, so we've had several guests, Ross Hodge, James Miller. <clears throat> I'm probably missing one or two others that have mentioned your name in specific regards to the role as an associate head coach and that they've learned specifically from you. Uh, I think Ross Hodge talked about uh, just kind of always having his, uh, everyone else's back, you know, always falling on the sword and always um, going to your head coach and saying it's on you and not on maybe an assistant for something small that, as he put it, a head coach can um, sometimes, because he has so much on his plate, can just maybe want to lash out at a particular guy for something. that he, he talked about it again. James Miller talked about it for New Mexico State. Uh, would love for you just to expand on you guys' staff a little bit there um, and, and just that role and, and where you kind of got that understanding of how to create cohesion because you've had this role many times. You've had this role for Coach Stacy um, at many places. You've had it at uh, with Coach Stoudemire there and building a program from scratch. So such a critical role, the guy next to the head coach. So if you don't mind, talk about your staff, and what makes those guys great and just how you've kind of been able to figure that part out. 
Um, figuring it out has, has probably been through trial and error. Um, been on different staffs where um, maybe you felt like uh, one of the assistants doesn't trust you. And that's a, that's a very important role on a staff because you guys are so intertwined with everything you do from recruiting to academics, to practice, to games, to travel, to um, the amount of time you spend around each other. Um, that's a long time. It's a very long time. So the, the, the first piece is trust, um, blind trust. Um, and it, it's at some point, it's going to have to be blind. And when I say that, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, everybody likes everybody all the time. Um, in any relationship, there are going to be some times where you see things differently. Um, you just do. Um, you're human beings. You were raised differently. Um, things you may deem are, are vitally important may not be vitally important to someone else who was raised somewhere else by other people. Um, and you, at the end, you can still want to get to the same point, just the way you get there can be different. And um, our staff now is, is comprised of Luke Wicks, um, who is, is from um, Wyoming and, and raised in that area, um, and J.D. Luster. And uh, J.D.'s from San Diego. And it takes time. It, it takes time. You know, immediately when the staff was put together, um, those guys didn't know me from uh, a can of paint. And I didn't know them that way. But in order for me, just the way I do it, um, I, I can't really get to the core of Luke until I'm around his mother and father. And I really get a sense of who they are. And so the way Luke responds to different things, I can see in his parents. I get it. It makes sense. This is the way it looks through his lens. It doesn't mean we're going to get along or agree all the time. We're not. Um, but when we come to those impasses, the ability to reason and to leave the office with him knowing, regardless of how we're looking at it, when we turn around the corner, I got you. I got you. I got you. When we go in that little room um, and Coach Stoudemire is sitting at that desk, um, I got you. I got you. On the bullet for it, I, I got you. I got you. Even when um, you're not around and let's say the head coach has got a thorn in his side, you did something that he didn't like. Um, he has to have someone on that staff that he blindly trusts, blindly. I know he would never lead me down the wrong path. So let's say a coach says, you know, oh, well, Coach Burton does A, B, and C. Man, I can't stand it, man. You know, I can't stand it. I hate when he does A, B, and C. Don't do A, B, and C. Coach, why does he do A, B, and C? And the associate head coach or myself in that position, um, there are opportunities for you to say, I don't know why he does A, B, and C, because he's not very good. I don't know why he does A, B, and C, because he's a bad guy. I don't know why he does A, B, and C, because um, he doesn't like you. I don't know why he does A, B, and C, because he hasn't bought into you, coach. Or you can take a deep breath and look at coach and go, I've been there, man. I've been there. I've sat right where you're sitting. And uh, I think he's going to be just fine. Um, I think we can do A, B, and C to help him. Um, and if we do that, I think you're going to see him take off. I think you're going to see him take off. He'll go right through the roof um, and be outstanding. Um, this is what he does great right now. E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. Great. Unbelievable. A, B, and C, if we help him in this area, it'll all coincide together. He'll have the alphabet down. I can guarantee you. I've seen it before. You're right, Coach. You're right. You're right. Makes sense. You're right. You're right. 
come back, talk to Luke. Luke may say, hey, what did coach say? These are areas where you can take off right here. And he wants to see you take off. He wants to see you take off. So on A, B, and C, if you try it this way, I think, I think you're going to take off. On this staff, I think you're going to take off. You're going to the moon and back. You're going to the moon and back. You know, same thing with JD. Um, JD's younger than Luke, uh, much more inquisitive. Um, I understand his age. I understand my role, um, where his age is. I understand the way his mom's raised him, uh, him and his sister. Um, they both have uh, masters. Uh, I think his sister may be working on her PhD. I know how important education is to his mother. Um, and I know JD's goals. So when he's in, in inquisitive and talking about what about this? What about that? What about, th I try and answer that the way Coach Stoudemire would answer, not the way Leonard would answer. And that way, when he's around Coach Stoudemire and they're in one-on-ones, the questions he may have, Coach Stoudemire throws back the answers. He's already heard them. He already knows. He knows. And that, I think that, that helps build trust. Um, within the staff. Um, those guys know they can count on me. Um, I know I can count on them. We've been through many wars together. Now we're bonded at the hip. Um, and, and I think for years to come, um, as they move on, as we move on, we'll be friends forever. Okay. And, um, you know, that, that's kind of the way um, I've been able to do it. And I've taken some of that um, from being on the other side, being excluded maybe are feeling excluded on the staff um, because a guy can get alienated really quick on the staff. Um, yep. Jealousy can come in and, and creep in and why am I not getting this and I'm not getting that and coach never says my name. Um, what about what about me? What about what I've done? Um, I've been there. I've seen that. And um, I, I never wanted when I got into a role of a lead assistant, um, I, I never wanted um, to allow those things to, to, to rear their ugly heads. Um, yep. Luke, Luke just got named uh, silver top 50 coaches. I think it's amazing, outstanding. Um, I'm championing that. Um, I want to see him, I want to see him take it and, and, and do something great with it. Yeah, I think you're uh, that was a great answer coach. I think just to share a little bit of my thoughts on coach Perry with the room, I think you are genius when it comes to that role. Um, I think you have some innate, um, it's the word I use, invisible gifts to be able to understand a feel for people and to connect to them and lead them to go to where not only you want them to go, but to see the best in them and figure out how to get it out of them and, and make everybody together. And like I said, it goes without saying, uh, associate head coaches at other programs, New Mexico State, um, along with North Texas, have praised you and them learning how to be so skillful at their positions as associate head coaches on their staffs uh, by listening to you. So, so much, so much props to you on that coach, continuing the good work and paying it forward. Uh, we'll go two more kind of Pacific questions and then we'll let some people ask some questions in the room and then we'll go to basketball. Um, so this is kind of a fun question. This is what's one thing you love that you guys do in each four of these categories? What's one thing you love offensively you do, defensively in recruiting and in your culture? And then lastly, um, we'll ask a question kind of about how you rebuilt the Pacers or a part of that process after the Malice in the Palace to then going to a place like Pacific that was on uh, probations, had bad reputation, scholarship loss, was just in a complete uh, disarray. How did you use your experience with the Pacers to help Coach Stoudemire to, to build such a special thing you guys have going at Pacific? So first, answering those four questions, and then we'll go to that one. All right. Um, what's one thing I, I love that we do at Pacific offensively? Um, I like the way – I love the way we adapt. Um, we adapt offensively, um, and we do it accordingly. Um, our personnel changes. Um, our personnel gets older. Our personnel uh, gets more skilled. Um, we add new pieces. 
Um, we, we coach allows you to um, digest the new pieces and the maturation of your current roster the way you see it. Um, he does it the way he sees it. And when we come together, um, he'll put out some things and he'll go around the room and uh, you're able to express the way you feel freely. And, you know, the, the best part of the offensive part is, um, you, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta know when to step back um, offensively. You just gotta know when to step back. Um, I know it's fun. You know, there's a new set, we're gonna do this. You got a flare and then we got a pin down then we're gonna curl and we're hands back and it's a DHO. Then we're pick and roll. And then we, you gotta know um, when to step back and, and not to put a saddle on a Mustang. Um, you gotta know that. Uh, and, and if you can do that, um, that Mustang can take you to new heights. Um, there are times where you gotta pull back a little bit and give, give your kids some structure. Um, but there are times where um, you, you got to take the saddle off and, and let that Mustang do what he does. And, and we, we were able for three years to do that with, with a jolly little trip. And, uh, you know, I think Coach learned a lot. And, and really, I thought he was exceptional in how he put Jalil, uh in situations where, that were going to be advantageous for us from point guard to center. Um, and then, and then watch him take us where he took us. Um, so I, I really enjoy that about what we do. Defensively, um, the one thing I, I love that we do at Pacific is we compete. Um, I don't know how to not compete. Um, I've got a, maybe I have a competing problem. Um, <laughs> I don't wanna say I'm addicted to competing, but I sincerely, thoroughly enjoy competing. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's chewing gum, blowing a bubble. Um, I, I compete over everything, over everything I compete. Um, how fast I can turn a corner, uh, walking, uh, shooting, um, passing. Um, I, just, I just love competing. I love the art of a winner and loser. I do. I, I really love it. Um, there's pain in losing. Um, there are lessons in losing. And um, it drives me. Um, so coach kind of uh, allows me to put our, our kids in competitive situations. And I, I love that defensively we compete. We just compete. We're going to compete in every facet. Um, in, in recruiting, you know, I think, you know, you touched on it before and we'll touch on it a little bit later, but uh, inheriting what we've inherited, the, the lesson learned was um, we listen to our guts. Um, we, we have to listen to our gut. If, if there's a red light flashing um, in recruiting, you probably don't want to run it um, because you're going to pay for it down the line. You're, you're going to pay for that. Um, you're ignoring signs. Uh, maybe it's a kid that really doesn't want to come, but he's on the brink of coming because he doesn't have anything else better. Um, maybe a kid is holding you hostage about how many shots he's going to take how many minutes he's gonna play. You know better as a coach, as a staff, you know better, but you do it anyway and you end up paying for it in the long run. You end up losing the exact same amount of games um, that you normally were gonna lose if you didn't have them. So you probably would have had a better, a better time um, in, in terms of recruiting and, and I think that um, Shaka Smart said it best um, in recruiting. Um, is our relationship gonna depend on how much you play? Because, because if it is, it, this isn't the place for you. Um, it's just not, I plan on having this relationship from now on. Um, Pierce Hornung just got married, um, got a chance to, to FaceTime that, that event. Um, th those relationships are going to last forever. Um, and you don't want a relationship with a guy that's saying, well, you didn't play me X amount of minutes. And the parents say, well, you said uh, you're going to play X amount of minutes. You didn't play X amount of minutes. Now we really just don't want to continue this relationship. I don't think that's healthy. Um, I don't. 
And, and the last piece to, I love what we do in recruiting. I think we do a good job of striking while the iron is cold. You know, um, a lot of people sitting there, I'm not sure, oh, he doesn't do this. Who else is recruiting him? How many visits has he taken? Uh, I don't know, he missed three shots in a row. If you've done your work, both on and off the floor, if you've done it and you know you've done it, um, strike while the iron is cold. Strike while the iron is cold and uh, you, you'll have a bag of goodies at the end and, and everybody will be sitting there going, I knew I should have took that kid, I, I had him. He, I had him, he wanted to come, I didn't take him. Um, and you take him and you got a star on your hands. Uh, last please, uh, the, the culture. Um, I love what we do because we keep accountability, accountability at our front door. Um, we've we've kind of, we, we learned that together as a staff. And uh, when you struggle, a person struggles with accountability, they're probably gonna struggle academically, they're probably gonna struggle socially. Um, they're going to struggle really in life. Um, accountability is huge. Um, be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Act the way you're supposed to act when you get there. And it's really that simple. Um, we do a good job with those things, and I love those things about what we do here at Pacific. No, that's awesome, Coach. It makes, it makes sense why you guys have had the success. So talk real quick before we go and open up uh, to the audience and then break to your presentation. Tell us just a little bit about, again, we, we talked about the Malice in the Palace and you got the job with Indiana right after that. So um, that NBA organization was kind of in a place that they needed to stabilize, needed to get back on a winning track. Uh, and obviously you experienced that firsthand at the NBA level and then uh, you've had success coming back to college, Southern Miss, Colorado State. Then you go to Pacific with Coach Stoudemire when the program is just in a uh, really tough spot, you know, as tough a spot as you can probably be in. And uh, just getting off of those um, lost scholarships just now, if I'm not mistaken. So tell us a little bit about last question and last answer. How did you take that experience and help, um, you know, resurrect this whole thing at Pacific with Coach Stoudemire? Well, um, all, all the credit goes to, uh, I'm, I, it's gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer twofold. All, all the credit goes to uh, Larry Bird, Donnie Walsh, and, and Damon Stoudemire. Um, those guys were at the head of those, those companies. So they deserve all the credit that there is. Um, I played a minute part in it, um, but I was in it. And what's happened with George Floyd, I've seen pieces of it. Um, with the, pal the, the malice in the palace. Um, because if you don't think there was a racial divide then in the state of Indiana with all black players going into the stands, getting into it with fans that did not look like them, um, that, that it was, it was uh, the, the, stereo the stereotype that went along with um, assuming what these people are um, was, it was horrendous. Um, it, it was horrendous. And um, when I got there, um, the fans had left. They had left um, Indiana, which was known all the way back to their days, uh, Market Square Arena. Um, it was known at Conseco, at Conseco, tough place to play, sold out. Indiana's a basketball state. Um, those fans did not come back. Um, they did not come back. And that team was going to have to be rebuilt. Well, what do you mean by rebuilt? Well, um, it wasn't going to be um, moving forward. They weren't going to keep Steven Jackson, um, Jermaine O'Neal, Jamal Tinsley, um, Marquise Daniels. Um, they weren't going to keep all of these guys um, on this team together. And, and it was no, no one's fault. Ron Artest. It was no one's fault um, that was a part of the Indiana Pacers. It wasn't. The reactions were wrong. Um, if Stack Jack had it to do over again, he wouldn't have done it. Um, he's the most loyal human being I've ever known. Um, Jermaine O'Neal's uh, 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 just a genius in, in what he does off the floor and all of his philanthropies. Um, Jamal Tinsley with the people he takes care of um, today. Um, Marquise Daniels is a salt-of-the-earth person. Um, 
these are these are tremendous human beings, good guys, good people, really good people. But in order for them to survive uh, in the NBA in that small market, they were gonna they were gonna have to change that team, and they did. Um, starting with Ron Artest, um, it slowly trades started happening. Um, we acquired Mike Dunleavy, um, Troy Murphy. Um, you know the team the team dynamic changed, and we were gonna have to do more homework in terms of uh, who we brought in, um, how they fit geographically, where we were community-wise. Um, so we understood that and we did it. Um, we did it, everybody ended up happy um, and, and in the places they needed to be. So it, it ended up working out uh, really well in Indiana. We built through the draft, um, we didn't do it through trades. Um, we got Paul George, um, it, was, it was piece by piece. And, uh, David Morway, um, who was the GM at the time, um, Peter Dinwiddie, who's now vice president, um, Ryan Carr, the scouting department. Um, we put a lot of time into to putting that team together. And we, 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 we turned the corner um, at a real slow, play, so, slow pace. Um, Rick Carlisle ended up being let go um, after uh, the season. And uh, Mr. Bird kept me on. Um, I moved into the front office and um, I was privy to information on building a team through the salary cap um, that I never would have gotten a chance to learn. And um, the lessons that I've learned in coming to Pacific is that it, this is not going to happen overnight. Um, what was done was done. It happened. The sanctions came down. We had the scholarship losses. Um, they were severe um, based on the, the penalties, say, for Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher just got recently um, a show cause for six games. Um, <laughs> the, the scholarship loss, you know, for uh, three years was, was unbelievable. And we're going to have to do it piece by piece. And we were able to do that. We took our time. Um, we were going to take some licks along the way. Coach Stoudemire knew it. I knew it. Um, we, 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 we took them like a man. And uh, we knew what we were building towards. Um, we got a core piece in Jalil Tripp, who I can't say enough about, but hung his hat on us getting to the point we got to this year. He knew he could see, um, and his mom could see, and, and his stepfather could see the vision that we had for him in this program. And uh, he never wavered, uh, never got into the transfer portal, um, never quit. Uh, never walked out on us, uh, never blamed us. Um, he knew what it was. We slowly built it. We got better and better and better. And uh, this year we were able to take off, but it, it was a lot of pain involved. Um, but I had been through it before. Um, we, had re we had rebuilt before. Um, I was with Coach, Coach Eustachian. We rebuilt Utah State. It had never been to the NCAA tournament in 20, 30 years, and we did it. Um, at Iowa State, um, we, they had never won the Big 12. Um, ever. We won it back to back. Um, but we could see what it was going to take. Um, we understood the league. Um, our staff played an integral part um, in doing the same thing here. Um, Luke was able to give us the blueprint um, because he had been in San Francisco in this league. Um, and, and we understood um, from the inside out what it would take. Um, and we went out and got the right guys, the right pieces, and um, really, really proud of, of what we did. Yeah, hats off. I mean, I think if I'm not mistaken, most, is it most wins in school history? Is that is that what I read? Yeah, most, most wins in the in the history of the WCC since we've been in it. Um, record after record um, this year. Several records. Several. Uh, Coach Stoudemire got Coach of the Year. Did. Well deserved. Um, did. Had some players get some individual recognition. Uh, so yeah, just an awesome awesome year and finished tied for third, if I'm not mistaken, in the, in the league. Um, it's right there, right there at the top. Okay and have a chance to continue to build on it. So thanks so much for sharing all that. We'll open the room for questions and then we'll get to your basketball presentation. But uh, awesome, awesome uh, insight to a uh, great journey, a great career, and uh, looking forward to listen, listening to you teach us some basketball too, Coach. So we'll open up the floor for questions from anybody who has for questions for Coach Perry. Um, play twice. Coach Perry, Kareem Brown here. Um, if you were offered you that uh, your Idaho State job again, um, 
you know, five years from now, what, what do you think you would do differently? Just one thing. Ooh, coach, that's an outstanding question. That, that is, <clears throat> it's an outstanding question. Um, one thing, my staff, my staff, um, my staff, if, if I couldn't fund it correctly, um, so I could go out and get the guys that I needed, um, I'd have to take a long, hard look at accepting it. Um, I, I think it's the most important thing you're going to do. Um, your staff is, it's everything. It, it's everything. If you, if you miss or you settle in one position, one, one, from the ops to the GA, no matter where it is, you'll spend the rest of your tenure trying to make up for that one miss. Mm. And it will hold you back. You have to hit a home run with your staff. You have to. It's a must. It's a must. So if there's one thing, um, I'd have to hit it out of the park with my staff. Um, if I had to take money off my salary to make it right for my staff, I'd do it. Um, I'd do it. It's that important. Big time question, Kareem, and great, great answer, powerful answer. Uh, who, who else? Uh, let's take a couple more before we let Coach get some basketball presentation. I got a question. Uh, Lester Stewart, Casper College. Um, I had, so when you um, got removed or the guy let go of Idaho, like fired. How fired is the right word, Lester. Fired. Say it with me. Fired. You <laughs> <laughs> got fired from Idaho. How was your, um, like, Basically, like, where were you, where were you at, and what, and I know you said, Coach, you actually came through um, and, and was like, hey, we're going, you know, you should try to do this. But, like, mentally, how did, like, get your, you know, get your swag back? Like, how did you, wow. you know, get back to it? It's a, it's a great question. That's a, that's a great question, Coach. Uh, uh, I was depressed. Um, I was depressed. I, I had never seen failure before um, from the time that I was a child. Uh, I, I, I was one of those kids that wanted everything he did, every single thing he did. I, I, have, I had championships from the time I was six years old to that day. Um, I had been successful at everything I'd ever done. Um, so um, I, I, I could not figure out how I got to that point. Um, and, and I had a change in athletic directors and presidents, but that's, that's no excuse. Um, I didn't get it done. And I, I live with that daily. Um, I get up with it daily as competitive as I am. I walk around with it daily. Um, before every game, um, I, I wrestle with it before every practice. I wrestle with it. Um, I feel like a failure. I still feel like a failure. And, the one thing I know through the grace of God is I'm not a failure and I'm going to die a winner. Um, so if the opportunity presents itself again, um, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind, not only am I going to win, I'm going to win big. Um, I truly believe every day that I wake up, every night that I go to sleep, that I'm going to coach in the final four as a head coach. I believe that I do now. That being said, Ross Hodge will be the first to tell you, I am the same guy that plays the lottery every week and literally thinks he's going to win every week, every single week, every week. I play one ticket and I go, that's it. That's it, fellas. 150 million. There it is right there. So I, I believe in the energy of winning. Um, I do. I, I believe in it. I, I believe it's at my core. Um, and I, I, I don't believe in anything other than that. And I think that transfers to people. Uh, I do. I, I think it bleeds. Um, but I, I just, I just, I believe in, in doing it the right way. Um, I've done it the right way. I've never been in any trouble with the NCAA. I think it can be done the right way. And um, I truly, honestly believe I'm going to win everything I, 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 uh, I venture into. Thanks, Coach. Mm -hmm. Great question, Les. Great question. Good answer, Coach. 
We'll take one or two more, and then we'll let Coach uh, present some hoops. I'll ask a question, Coach. When you when people are looking to make that jump to a head coaching position, how do you know when it's the right? Is it feel? Is it a a little bit of gamble? Is it taking a look, taking a chance? Well, how do you know and what do you look for for the right type of feel? I mean, we would love to keep you in Damon forever, but the reality is, you know, you have dreams and aspirations too. So when you look for a next step, what do you look for? What do you look for? Mike, that's a great question. Um, well, in my position, I, I, I look for an opportunity, but I've been around this business long enough to know it's got to be the right opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, there are jobs out there that are not the right fit for me. Um, I think Coach would agree and say, as a matter of fact, I know he said it a million times, um, there, there are situations that are not right for him. Um, it has to be the right situation. Um, this is a special place. I've been treated so special here. Um, and I'm just an assistant, but I love it here. Um, it would, it would, it would have to be a right situation. Um, it really would. And, and, uh, the athletic director would have to be the right person. Um, the president would have to be the right person and obviously vice versa. They'd have to feel the same way about me. Um, it's a, it's a different landscape we're in in that search firms are, are running everything now. So, um, I would have to be uh, the right candidate for a search firm to uh, even give me consideration. So all the pieces have to fit. Um, if, if, if you're speaking uh, from a perspective of, will it be right? Is that the right guy? You, you, you really have to do your due diligence. Um, I think head coaches can be made in different ways. Some, some can grow into being tremendous head coaches. Um, some can study the profession and become tremendous head coaches. And there are, Mike, there, there are guys out there that are just born to do this. They are, you can put them anywhere. You can put them anywhere. They just figure it out. They, they, they have that it, it's a gift. And uh, they're, they're, they're coaches on this line that have, it's a, it's a, it's a gift. It, some guys have that gift and you can drop them anywhere in the planet and they're going to win. Um, they're they're going to win and they're going to win big. Um, it's just God blesses people that way. Um, so it can, it can come in many forms, but I think, I hope I answered your question in the sense that uh, it would have to be the right, the right situation. Thank you. Yeah, awesome stuff, Coach. We're going to get to the, to the good stuff now. I know we're going to get to some uh, basketball breakdown. You know, you have a wealth of experience, knowledge, and just nuggets to help us to grow as coaches on the floor, too. So excited for that. So we're going to go ahead and let you share your screen. All right. I am actually going to uh, sign off and pa pass the mic to Kareem and Anitra uh, to take over the moderation. I have a uh, commitment I have to run to real quick. but. Uh, Always a pleasure, Coach. Uh, look Thank forward you to for watching. having me, man. Yeah, look forward to watching the basketball replay on the YouTube, and uh, definitely continue to do a great job. What you're doing, man, you're making a huge impact on a lot of coaches in the industry. Obviously, you're doing a tremendous job everywhere you've been. Like you said, you compete to win, and uh, <clears throat> you just treat people so well, man. You make people feel special about who they are, and I think that's a unique gift you have. So keep sharing it, Coach. Keep sharing it. Keep paying it forward, keep doing good works. And whether you are, uh, the thing I love about you, you never complain, never talk about, man, I should be a head coach, man, I should be doing this, man, I should be doing that. Um, never have heard you talk like that ever. You just master and star in your role. Uh, you definitely have uh, won and continue to win and help uh, the programs you've been in win at a super high level. So um, I know whatever, you have next in store is going to be involved with winning and you making an impact in people's lives, players, coaches, and community. So you're going to do great work. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you, man. Yeah, for sure, man. All right.
All right. Um, this is what I, I wanted to do. If, I'm an avid reader. Um, if you guys, uh, I talk about uh, listening a lot. I talked about it today. Um, I, I'm going to continue to try to get so much better at listening, uh, not only to my family, but administratively um, on my job um, as an assistant. Um, and most importantly to our players, um, because communication is just, you know, it's, it's, it's just so vital. Um, and, and this book will challenge you um, in terms of communicating and being a good communicator and a good listener. This book will really challenge you. Um, we need to talk. It's a, it's a great, great book. And it challenged me um, to ask myself, how well do I listen? Like that, that's what I came out of it with. How well do I listen? You know, and am I an effective listener? Um, you know, th those two things I've really taken to heart and starting with my wife, um, I know that it's making a little bit of difference because she's telling me that I'm doing a better job at, at listening and digesting what she's saying. And that in turn uh, leads me to, to be a better father um, and a better grandfather, because um, I'm listening better. And I feel better because I, I, I feel like I'm giving my, my undivided attention. Um, I give myself a break off social media. Um, I think it's great for my mind. Um, I would encourage everybody to, to do that. Give yourself a break off of it, because if you don't, it'll wear you out. Um, doesn't mean you have to become inactive in what you're doing. Just the constant need to scroll and, and swipe and all those things. Give yourself a break and read some, read some good books um, while we have time. But this book, We Need to Talk, um, taught me a lot. Um, and I can see where the breakdown in communication um, comes because we ask our teams all the time, we want you to talk more, talk more, talk, communicate, communicate, talk, talk, talk. You're not talking. We're not loud enough. But if we think about it, almost all the other times, um, outside of when they're on the basketball court, we're usually telling them to shut up and listen. Think about that dichotomy. We're saying shut up all the time, but then for two hours, we're telling them to do nothing but talk. Communicate, communicate, talk. You gotta talk, you gotta communicate. That doesn't make sense. I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. You gotta communicate all the time. And you gotta be open to communicating all the time. Um, and this book is, is gave me some great, you know, just some great insight on how to communicate better. Um, if you think about this, and I'll leave this book alone, we send one trillion texts per month around the world. Think about that. One trillion, not a billion, a trillion texts, a trillion texts a month around the world. Just texts, emails. Think about that. And we, 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 we want to teach communication. All right, um, moving forward. We talk about some of the things um, that we've been able to accomplish. Um, this is a very, very important deal to us. Um, scoring defense, um, field goal percentage defense, uh, block shots per game, total blocks, um, defensive rebounding percentage, total rebounds, rebound margin offensive rebounds per game, okay? And then obviously free throws attempted, but I'm gonna tie all of these into one thing, rebounding, okay? So I'm gonna talk to you about rebounding and how important it is and how that's the one thing that you can get um, in your program um, that will transfer. It will go from gym to gym. Um, it will travel from program to program. Um, if you commit um, to teaching it um, and holding your kids accountable for it, it can win you championships. Um, it can win you games you have absolutely no, no business winning because you shot the ball so poorly. But if you come down defensively, if you get back in transition and you allow teams one crack at the basket consistently, one crack, and then you go and rebound the basketball. And when you come on offense and you shoot the ball and you give yourself another opportunity to score by going and getting it. 
um, you're going to have an opportunity to win games. And, and it'll travel um, anywhere you want to go with it. It'll travel. Defending and rebounding, it'll, it'll go anywhere. It'll go in any league from power five to low major to junior college, division one, two, three, four, NAI. Um, if you commit to it, you will have success um, with your team. Okay, I just want to show you guys, you know, we finished first in all those categories in one of the best leagues in the country. It's the top seven league in the country, okay? We really have to rebound the basketball. We don't have a team full of seven footers. We probably never will, okay? Um, but rebounding the basketball and allowing teams one crack at the basket um, when they're on offense is going to be vital um, in order for us to win basketball games, and we know that. Well, Coach, you may ask, well, how do you do that? Well, it's something that we do in some way, shape, or form every single day. Every day we do something that has to do with rebounding. We, we have to get that and make that a core part of our program. Kids know it when we recruit them. Kids know it when they're here. Kids know it when they leave. Kids get professional opportunities because, because of it. Um, it is vital in everything we do. Now, Coach, what about uh, specific, what do you do specifically to get your teams to rebound so hard? Well, we start from the very basics. Um, we tell our kids everything they do, do it with two hands. So you catch with two hands, you pass with two hands, you rebound with two hands. Okay, so we make a big emphasis on that. Um, this is called form rebounding. So we'll go two lines, and it's called form rebounding. Um, we're going to do this just about every day. Just about every single day we'll do this. Even if we're going to go light, we'll do it with no contact. Um, but we're going to do this every day. Go back here for a second. Getting sticky here. Uh, let's see if I can get it to go forward one more time. There we go. We're going to do this every day in this, this rebounding progression drill. We'll throw it against the backboard. We'll go get it with two hands. That, that's pretty basic, right? Throw it against the backboard. Go get it with two hands. Now, we teach you got to have a wide base. Get your feet apart a little bit more than shoulder width apart because there's going to be contact. You're rebounding in traffic, so there's going to be contact. We're going to do this every day. In some way, shape, or form, we're going to do it every day. Every day. Throw it against the, re throw it against the backboard. Go get it with two hands. Okay, pass it to the next guy and get it in the back of the line. Two hands looks boring, but we do it every day. Then we'll add, we will add a guy going over the back, and that'll simulate the game. Go get it with two hands. We want the defender going over his back, and we grab it with two hands. All right, we do it every day. That's a heavy ball that we use. We do that every day. So that's going to progress into a drill we call three-on-all rebounding. All right, the coach will have the ball. All three guys have got to pursue the ball. They got it when the ball is coming off the rim, they got to go get it with two hands. Um, if it's a long rebound, they all got to go get it. They all got to sprint to it. They, get, they throw the ball back to the coach and they, they sprint back to these three spots. We do that for 30 seconds at a time. If there's a guy, if your practice is going to be tough that day and the, and the rebound comes off, and one guy goes and sprints to get it, and the other two watch him, we'll start the clock over up here back to 30 seconds in the same groups out there, okay? So we'll, we'll rotate. We'll rotate three groups, three at a time, three at a time, three at a time. We'll have the groups already pre-planned. Pre I see Coach Phillips there. You've seen this drill, right, Coach? A couple of times, huh? We'll keep doing this. I have. Hey, that 3-0 that, uh, rebounding separates the men from the boys. 
Separates the men from the boys. <laughs> translates, coach. It translates. No question. And, yeah. My name is Ross Hodge, and I'm the I'm ahead of myself here. My computer's giving me some grief. Hold on one second. Let's see if we can get it to. All right, this time I'll just let it play through. I, I won't stop it. I'll let it play through. Okay. Again, as we go through this pro this progression, you'll see you'll see the whole progression of it. I'll let it play straight through, and I'll talk through it. It'll go a little bit faster. Again, we'll start it. Two hand rebounds, two lines. Then we'll add a guy going over the back, okay? We take our time with it. We don't rush it. Uh, we make sure guys are doing it right. It'll get a little physical. Nobody's going to get hurt. Coach Phillips from Colorado State will attest to that. Nobody's going get, to get hurt. Um, it'll get a little physical. Guys get a little competitive. Uh, that's going to help you. I heard Coach Hodge say the other day, um, they have some fun things that they do. We have some fun things we do too. Um, but, you know, if we're going to get this in the game, we got to get it in the game. Something we got to work on every day. That's a soft rebound right there. We point that out to them. We'll watch tape on it. We want guys on the floor. They throw the ball back. We can throw it right back to the player. If we get the defenders to wall up. If he can score it, he'll score it. If he can't, he throws it back to the coach. We want them going and getting it with two hands, going hard for 30 seconds. Okay, then that will progress to a three-on-three -three rebounding drill. Well, we have two coaches out. We got we got guys and we got lines in, in three different spots over the floor. So when the coach is here, you'll be one pass away, then you got to get off. On help side, you got to turn and block a guy out. We want the offense going full speed. You'll have a line in three, three areas on the floor, wing, top, wing. You got to get, get three rebounds to get out of it. That's how you get out of it. We want the offense going hard to the glass. Gets a little physical. We want two-hand rebounds. But this is a big part of what we do. It's a big part of us rebounding. The basketball is a big part of our program. It's a big part of how we win. We believe that if you can do this on a consistent basis, you give yourself a chance to win every night. We really believe that. You got a stunt at the ball handler, the ball shot. Nobody's guarding the ball. Um, so those will be open shots. And then you'll see kind of how this translates into the game. We want three guys going to the offensive glass at all times. We'll send two guards back. Our guys are going to go get it. They're going to go get it. They're going to go get it. They're going to go get it. We pound that in our program. Go and get it. It's going to win you games. We were really, really good at going and getting it. These are big plays down the stretch. It's really solidified third place right here. On offensive rebounds, that's Jalil Tripp. Um, and this right here seals the deal after we were down the majority of the game and won. 11 seconds to go, you win the game, you finish in third place. Um, that's a big deal for us. That's a really, really big deal for us. So um, we emphasize rebounding. We work at rebounding. Um, I learned that from Larry Eustachie. Um, we did it as a player, um, and it's, it's very, very important, um, you know, to, to our program and what we do. Okay, um, I was asked this earlier, my why. What, what is my why? Um, what, what is my why? And the best way I could, I could get this into words was, was to do it this way. Th this is my why. 
um, my relationship with Ross Hodge, with Luke Wicks, with J.D. Luster, um, with uh, Brian Burden, um, with all the assistants and head coaches that I meet, um, that's, this is my why. This is, this is exactly why I do it. We talk about legacies and all of those things. This is why I do it. Um, so I, I can, I feel like I can impact other people's lives. Um, I do. So I just wanted you got wanted to share this with you guys, um, to kind of put it in perspective if I could. My name is Ross Hodge and I'm the associate head coach at the University of North Texas. I've had the pleasure of knowing LP for probably shoot, what is it, seven or eight years now. The impact he's had on me professionally stretches, you know, all the way from managing people, managing situations, learned so much about the game of basketball, um, you know, how to handle the staff in my role, you know, as the next next person in charge, um, how to make sure everybody's on the same page, everybody's, you know, feeling good about what's going on. I mean, the lessons, you know, that we were able, that I was able to learn those five years, you know, I've taken with me and applied those on a daily basis. And then you know, the biggest impact that he's had on me personally is just my personal relationship, you know, with him, you know, seeing how he's raised his daughters, and, um, you know, the love that he has for his wife, Chris, now is just, it's, it's unbelievable to, to watch that and see the impact that he's had on a lot of people, you know, and he just loves, loves players, loves people, loves seeing people grow. So I can't thank him enough. My name is. Got a surprise there. What up? This is Brian Burton here. Want to give some quick thoughts on my boy LP. I wrote down a few notes of what came to mind when it comes to LP. Mentorship, wisdom, wise counsel, laughter, knowledge, uh, someone who believes in me, uh, someone who I know has my back, someone to lean on, someone to learn from. Uh, coach gave me some incredible knowledge and advice outside of uh, basketball that I still use to this day to pay forward to young men that are looking to get married and looking to make that jump. Uh, coach gave me some incredible wisdom and perspective and advice on just how to approach uh, having that hard conversation of uh, what it's like to be a coach's wife and a coach's spouse and kind of painting that worst picture and also painting the best picture, but let them know kind of what they're signing up for and uh, what expectations are. And uh, that conversation led to me and my wife, uh, now wife, uh, actually getting engaged then and uh, being happily married for two years. So uh, LP is one of those uh, special people who uh, make people better, who help them believe more in themselves. And maybe they even do. He's a master at uh, being able to navigate situations that are difficult and make them better. Uh, he's kind of one of those people that uh, just brings out the best in other people and is, has an ability to elevate uh, and connect and have charisma to uh, bring light to situations that don't, don't normally have light. So anyway, best of uh, celebration of LP. God bless. Congrats on the new grandchild. Uh, and love you, man. Later. What? Hello, my name is Rashad Powell. I'm the Dean of Students at Renton High School in Renton, Washington. I'm also the head varsity boys basketball coach at Renton High School. I've known Mr. Leonard Perry since 2001, where I was a student athlete at University of Idaho from 2001 to 2004, where he was my head coach. Uh, in that time, I learned a tremendous amount about 
life, basketball, and everything in between from Coach Perry. Uh, his impact in my life has been immeasurable, not just athletically, but personally. He's continued to be a role model and, and mentor and factor in my life, even 15 years after my playing career finished at the University of Idaho. We've maintained regular contact, uh, not only, again, about athletics, but about life. Through basketball, it's taught me a lot of characteristics that have been true today that have helped me in that helped me in as a student athlete, helped me in my post-college collegiate life, uh, helped me in my professional career. And now as the Dean of Students um, and head boys basketball coach, a lot of the characteristics that he taught and instilled in me, I'm now instilling into the next generation of, of young people. And again, not just via athletics. Uh, characteristics such as commitment, hard work, dedication, perseverance, mental toughness, physical toughness, all the things that, that are necessary to be successful, not only in athletics, but life. Um, and he's taught me a lot of those lessons through life, and which is one of the reasons I'm so thankful for him, uh, being able to just having the opportunity to have him be a part of my life. Um, I know he, I would not be where I am today as the Dean of Students, as a, as a four-year college graduate, um, now also possessing a master's degree without the things and opportunities that Coach Perry uh, blessed and bestowed upon me. So, all right, open it back up to questions. No, that was great, uh, Leonard. Uh, I, I have a question to kind of start us off now. Uh, obviously, we've been home for, for three months. Uh, we're doing a lot of homeschooling and things like that. How, how do you feel or what things you think are you going to do differently um, when, when basketball comes back full tilt in order to balance that family and basketball? You know, Coach, I'm going to stay on this thing. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is be a better listener. Um, I, I'm going to be – I've already become a better listener to our kids um, in our program. Um, I'm going to continue that aspect at home. I, I like it. I've enjoyed it. I think it's made me smarter. It's made me wiser. Um, I'm, I'm learning. I'm so engulfed with uh, Generation Z um, and what's going on socially. Uh, my ears to the street there. Um, I communicate a lot with, with our players um, about everything, but a, a ton through music. I, I, our kids... Our kids are big on music. This generation's big on music. And it's really been that way for a long time. But I spent a lot of time with that, understanding what they're listening to, why, what it means, what they're saying. Um, how does it relate to life, sports, their family life? How does it, how does it relate to my family life? Um, so I got a 21-year-old um, black man in my home. So I need to know what's going on. Um, I, I need to know how you know, what, what, the, what the vibrations are, um, not only um, in this country and in my family, but with our players, with their families, um, on, the, on the AAU circuit, um, I, I need to know what's going on. I, I'm not one of those guys that, you know, people label as a, a, a OG this or OG, I'm not that. I, I'm, I'm an assistant coach and, and I'm deeply entrenched in what's going on with our guys. We appreciate that. Do we have anyone um, with any uh, other questions that we can ask Coach Perry? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question if it'd be all right. Uh, James Miller from New Mexico State. Coach Perry, um, you talked about it earlier, and, and we've talked about it over the phone um, in time, about you're not a self-promoter. Uh, obviously, the people on this call who don't, know you weren't familiar with you understand how great you are and your passion but the fact that you're not a self-promoter and you just do a good job what in your mind maybe even over the course of the last six months to a year are you going to try to do to put yourself in position to become a head coach again because we all know that you're fully capable of doing a great job um that's the question i have and, and contrary to what you just said i think you are an og thank you <laughs> Uh, you know, that's a, that's a great question, coach. Um, you know, 
I'm not going to get invited to the next chairs and the and the the new the the the, the interviews for this and the interviews for that. Um, I you know I, I don't I don't know why I don't know what else to do because because if you're dealing with agents, um, agents will tell you just win more games. You know just be a part of a winning program, win more games, which is you know I, I've done that. You know I've. I've, I've done that everywhere I've been. Um, so that's a, that's a great question, coach. I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just not gonna, I'm probably, maybe, maybe it means I don't get one in, in the sense that I'm not going to run around uh, waving a flag saying, I'm so great at this. It's ridiculous. Um, top, you know, name me top 10 this or top 10 that. Um, I was always taught to let the work speak for itself. Um, and I, I, I'm hoping that there's going to come a time where it gets back to um, the core of, can this guy get this done? Can he get this job done? Um, we're looking for a basketball coach that's knowledgeable, that's one, that has experience, um, that, that is a competitor, um, that uh, makes young men better um, and can lead a program, whether it has football or not. Um, you know, he lives his life the right way. Um, I, I'm hoping and praying that it gets back to that. I'm not sure that it's about that right now. Um, I'm just not sure because, um, you know, I'm a uh, I, I've got my nose in the grind. Um, I've recruited at a high level. Um, I've done a, a lot of things that are quote unquote required for the opportunity. And um, the only thing I know to do is to keep pounding the rock until it cracks. And uh, conversely, I'm not an OG. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see. Coach uh, Brandon Dunson here. Uh, Coach, what's happening, man? Uh, I'm going to back up James and say uh, you are the OG, the triple OG. And, uh, <laughs> and hit me and told me you was going to be on. That's literally the text I have says triple OG. <laughs> but, uh, just had a question about your rebounding stuff. Uh, obviously, you have your progression stuff. And you guys have a lot of just versatile pieces, but is there anything that you guys do different for guards and bigs or, uh, or maybe your wings versus your bigs from a rebounding standpoint? Well, um, Coach Johnson, I'm going to give you the answer to this question uh, after December 19th when we play you. Um, I, I know what you're doing. Um, I know your boss. I know what he's doing. No, but, uh, you know, let me say this, man. Th thanks for coming on. Um, you, you guys, you, Coach Miller, um, you guys make me proud, man. You, you, you make me proud. Like, you, you make me – I get so happy watching you guys do what you do um, and, and knowing that if I can ever be there for you about anything, um, I'll be there. But I'm, I'm proud of what you're doing, proud of the young man you are, um, uh, proud of your boss. Um, you know, Miller, Miller – Coach Miller – I know this is off course, but Coach Miller, um, when he was at New Mexico, man, we, we had so much fun then going there, recruiting his players. And I didn't get a one of them. Um, going there, by the way, um, recruiting his players, uh, but watching him grow in this business, that's what this is about. This form, that's what it's about. But to answer your question, um, Coach, I can't, I can't give you an exception if you're on defense um, for – not rebounding the basketball. I, I, it really doesn't matter to me if you're 5'4 and you're out there, then why are you out there? If you can't help us get a stop, why are you out there? Why you, because you're so good offensively, but you're, you're a sinkhole defensively. So everything that um, you're giving us, you're giving back up defensively. So guards, we call, we call what we – we give them what we call a, an area where we tell them to rebound down. So that's the elbows in that elbow area. 
um, above the dot, the old dotted line, above the elbow line, but anything that comes off long, you better come up with that. Um, you need to come up with that. You, you guards have to rebound down. Three, fours, and fives, they're in the trenches. Um, they're, they're in the trenches. They can only, you know, they, you can't expect those guys to go rebound outside the three or if it's a long shot, that's a guard's rebound. Um, we put a number per game that we need our guards to average. Um, you need to come out of there with X amount of rebounds. Three, fours, and fives um, will be held um, with a number. Um, and then as we incorporate that and get up and down the floor, um, three, fours, and fives when the ball shot, you got to go get it. And then you got three seconds after the ball has been secured um, by the other team to get to half court in a, in a, in a full speed sprint. And uh, in the old days, we used to keep a stockwatch. Um, it used to be a GA with a stockwatch. And, uh, and if, he, if, if they didn't make it uh, to half court in three seconds, you know, coach would take them out. So <laughs> we, we've since, uh, you know, allowed a little, little latitude there. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Coach. Hey, this is Dietrich. <clears throat> just, just, just wanted to say as Brandon's, uh, as Brandon, somebody that works with Brandon, you are the triple OG. <laughs> just want to get on here and just, just say that real, real quick. Don't say nothing else to me about it. Don't say nothing else to nobody on the call about it. You are the triple OG. Just, just acknowledge that and just take it and move. Go on with your bad self. <laughs> okay, man. All right. Coach, um, coach Perry, this is Jordan Ingram. I'm a post-grad coach at Covenant College Prep. Um, yes, sir. I, question. So, like, in the, in the, um, in the new culture of a, of, a lot of, be, of a lot of guys being able to transfer – things like that, I know I feel like one big thing now um, at the college level and then all levels is basically to basically recruit your guys while they're there. Um, I'm like, I was just saying, like, what are some things that you guys kind of do uh, at Pacific to kind of make sure you're still recruiting your guys once you get them there? You know, Jordan, it's, life is about relationships. Um, life's about relationships. People, um, for the most part, um, are around people that they like or have similar interests. And um, I really work hard. I really work hard at this, Jordan. I really work hard at trying to be my best self. Um, and that means, as you can see with these guys, we're gonna have a lot of fun. Like, we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna, we're gonna laugh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk serious, we're gonna talk shooting the breeze, we're gonna talk movies, we're gonna talk music, we're gonna talk life. Um, I really try and be the best me that I can be. And the genuineness um, has got to translate at some point. If, if, a, if, a, guy is, if a guy is a good guy, um, he's got to have something in him that says, you know what, I get what's out there, I get it. I get it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang out with the dudes who believed in me. Um, I'm, I'm going to hang out with those dudes. Th those are the dudes I'm going to ride with. I, get, I hear what you're saying over there. I know that's a higher level over there. I, I understand that, but these guys believed in me from day one. They stayed with me. And knock on wood, we've had tremendous success with uh, those relationships. And, and more importantly, I agree with you, you, you have to recruit uh, daily the guys that are already there, but those relationships with the parents, the open honesty, even the good and the bad, even the good and the bad. Um, if a parent is feeling a type of way, you got you to put it out there and we got to talk about it. We got to talk about it. I've had, we had parents, one of our starters, um, mom came, flew all the way out with her mother to see her child. He didn't play. He didn't play. I knew that how that was going to make them feel. I understood it. I knew it. I knew it. I let it breathe. It's okay. Um, sent a soft text. You all right? You want to talk? You know, I, I knew it was going to be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and then a day later, we have this conversation. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. He didn't play. It was one game. Um, if you were going to be at every game, um, you'd probably see your son play. So many minutes, you get tired of seeing them out there. But this particular night, and us trying to win this game, and I know how bad um, you want us to succeed, 
Um, I know how bad you want him to learn lessons. Um, he was late for this. You know, he wasn't going to play. It didn't matter if you, you flew in or not. We still love him to death. He just wasn't going to play this game. So he needs to be ready. Um, you need to talk to him. Um, I'm going to talk to him. And let's make sure that we hold him accountable as opposed to patting him on the back, telling him, you know, oh, you should have played, uh, you should transfer. No, let, let's, let's hold him accountable like the real world is going to do. Because you can't transfer jobs. You can't transfer jobs. There's no, tra no, no, you got a good job. Um, you better make sure that you have signed the documents on the new job and the first week's check is on its way before you leave the job you have. Because if you don't, and you just say, oh, I'm unhappy. I don't like the way they talk to me. I don't like now you're out of a job. That's one more mouth to feed with nothing coming in. So this is a real world that we try to prepare the kids for with the honesty. Um, Coach. Do we have anyone else? Hey, L LP man, lo love you to death. I, I missed the I missed the first part of the I missed the first part of the call. I apologize, um, but I mean for for all of you that are still on board, um, you know, Coach Perry and I work together. I'm a, a, a strength and conditioning coach. Um, we worked together for almost five years, and I don't know if we ever had a conversation about basketball. Um, but talk, talk a little bit, if you don't mind, um, and, and I, I know that we've got mostly coaches that are, that are in the call, but, but talk a little bit about what the culture of a program is and, and how to build that. Because I, I know that's something that, that, that's hot right now and everybody talks about it, but, but talk about how important that is and, and, and what that looks like to your athletic trainers, to your strength coaches, to your athletic directors. Uh, coach, I love you to death, man. Uh, miss you terribly and your family as well. But I see you guys on Instagram, so I keep track. I, those kids are, I can't believe how big they're getting. Oh, my God. Um, to answer your question, I think it's a great question. Um, the culture is, what's your culture in your house? What is your culture in your home? Um, if you guys are leaving as a family, do, and you're leaving at five o'clock, do your children show up to the car at 5.30? Um, if your wife tells you that dinner is served at whatever, uh, four o'clock, do you show up at seven? Um, when your wife is talking, do you cut her off? When you're talking, does she cut you off? Do your children cut each other off? Do they, what's your culture in your home? Um, what you really believe in is what you're going to allow your culture to be, and it's going to show. If you don't care about being on time, then somebody's going to start coming in a little bit late and a little bit later and a little bit later until another guy says, that's okay, coach don't really care about that. I'll be a little bit late. Um, if that's your culture, you're going to live it. You're going to live it. You can't hide it. You can't say, this is our culture. Um, we always tell the truth. And then three days later, you say you're going to do something and don't do it. That's the culture that you just built. That's what you built, not what you wrote, what you did. Um, if, if, if you're holding guys accountable for being on time, if you're holding guys accountable for uh, act in a certain way, then you certainly better be able to follow those codes because they're watching you. They're watching you. 24 hours, they're watching you. You're watching them on social media, guess who's watching you, okay? I always tell myself this. If I start feeling a way about a player um, and I'm not feeling good and we haven't had a chance to sit down and have dialogue, Chances are, if I feel that way about him, that's exactly how he feels about me. And that energy keeps meeting right there. It never 
It never gets to a point where my energy's here, here his energy's there, and I pull him up. No, the energy meets right here. So I'm like, I, I, I don't like the way you're acting right now. And, and the player, if he were honest, would say, I don't like the way you're acting right now either. I, <laughs> the energy I'm getting from you is what I'm giving back. It's like a mirror. It's really like a mirror. So um, I, I think about that daily. So when I have academic meetings, when I have basketball meetings, when I'm running a scouting session, I think about that. And uh, I think about if I were them, um, what my level of empathy is um, as a coach, putting myself in their shoes. Um, was it a long day? Did we just get back from flying? Um, did we lose a game? Did we win a game? Um, you know, is it a weekend? Um, I, I, I try to use empathy more than I ever have. How exactly is the player feeling? And if I can use empathy, chances are, if I become good at that, he becomes good at it. He, he puts his arm around me and says, hey, coach, how you doing, man? You, you having a good day? Everything okay? And then I, what do I do? I, in turn, say, Amari, thank you, man. Thank you for asking, man. Thank you for asking, man. I had something on my heart, and you asked me, can I, can I confide in you? Can I, can I let you know what's going on with me today? Um, let, me, let me tell you what happened to me. What is he, in turn, doing? Coach, you wouldn't believe what my mother said, what happened to my mother, da, 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 da. Now I know exactly what's on his mind, okay? Doesn't mean I'm going to excuse him from practice or excuse myself from holding him accountable. What it means is I'm able to put myself in his shoes. I think we're missing this as a country. No one can put themselves in someone else's shoes. You're a Republican. You must be for Trump. I hate you. <laughs> people don't understand there, there are people that are married one's a democrat one's a republican doesn't mean they don't love each other they just disagree on political parties that's all it's okay it's all right it's all right um but to answer your question coach i hope that answers it from a culture standpoint um the culture is who you are and what you show up with every day. That's your culture. That's your culture. You can preach it, you can write it down, you can type it, you can put it all over the walls. But if, if people think you're a dishonest person and your word doesn't mean anything, um, but you come to practice and you eventually, it filters into your program. Coach, it was absolutely great just listening to you. What What's one or two things you would like to leave the audience uh, with? Well, I, you know, I, I would say this. I, I would, you know, people talk about legacies all the time. If I'm being judged by how many basketball games I won, um, <laughs> it's, that's just, I just think that's a, I, I think that's a silly existence. I, I do. I think it's a silly existence. Well, he's a, this is what kind of guy he is because of this, this is how many games he won. Um, that has nothing to do with the kind of person you are. Um, I, I would simply put, put it into this and this is how I feel about it. I like to be a guy that's easy to remember and hard to forget. And, and that's it. For no other reason, easy to remember, hard to forget. Um, usually if, if those are the thoughts, you've done something good in life and, uh, you know, some people, some people really care about you. And coach, it is very clear that you have a lot of people that care about you, which is super awesome. Um, I know that I don't normally show my face. My name is Anitra Miller. I am with All Access Coaches Corner. Um, I have a few final thoughts. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, especially Coach Perry. I appreciate you joining us, sharing your wisdom and your experiences along the way. Um, Brian would like for me to remind you to please put your information, Coach Perry, into the chat so okay. that the other coaches and assistants can contact you. Okay. Um, I would also like to make sure that for those of you who are not, that you follow us on social media, 
follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that way you never miss a replay. I would also like to give a big thank you once again to Rising Coaches. We appreciate you very much and make sure that you guys stay tuned for next week's show. Uh, we will have Coach Dominique Taylor Associate Head Coach of Bethune-Cookman at 5 p.m. Central, uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, so thank you guys very much for joining us today. We appreciate you greatly. And everyone, please be sure to have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone be safe. Thank you. Thank you.